Now, we will start by the famous judgment, because it received quite a lot of publicity when it came out, especially by those involved in politics. C715-17, Commission versus Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic. This case concerned the compliance of Poland, Hungary, and the Czech Republic with council decisions, the relocation decisions, which had been adopted in the context of the 2015 emergency situation in Italy and Greece, following increased arrivals of third country nationals. So according to Article 5.2 of both decisions, each member state had to indicate the number of persons to be relocated in its territory. So Poland and the Czech Republic indicated the center number of individuals that would be relocated to their territory without following up on the implementation of this commitment, with the exception of the relocation of 12 people that were indeed transferred to the Czech Republic. Hungary did not indicate any number of persons to be relocated and did not take any steps to implement any relocation scheme. Following an unsuccessful pre-litigation procedure, the European Commission sought a declaration from the court that by not properly indicating the number of applicants for international protection, each member state had failed to fulfill their obligation under these two council decisions. Regarding admissibility, the court rejected the argument put forward by three member states that any judgment by the court would be merely declaratory as the relocation decisions are no longer valid and would not be in line with the remedial character of any infringement procedure. I would say to this, nice try. The court noted the, ex the existence of a pre-litigation procedure as an opportunity for the member states to comply with their obligations and held that to accept the argument of the three member states would distort the meaning of infringement proceedings and disrespect the values of the European Union by disregarding the binding nature of the council decisions. As far as the substance of the judgment as has concerned, um, the member states cannot merely refer to the existence of public order and security concerns under Article 72 in order to derogate from their obligations without proving that it was necessary to do so. Member states cannot invoke this provision in the context of general prevention, but must directly link it with a specific case. And in the spirit of solidarity and the binding nature of the relocation decisions, member states should not derogate on the basis of a member state's own assessment of the effectiveness of the mechanism without suggesting a sound legal basis. So on that point, the alleged lack of cooperation from Italy and Greece does not render de facto the mechanism ineffective but it should be solved in the spirit of cooperation and mutual trust. A very strong statement on behalf of the court. Now, in terms of the outcome, the court declared that by failing to indic indicate at regular intervals, at least every three months, an appropriate number of applicants for international protection who can rel be relocated swiftly to the territory, the Re Republic of Poland failed to fulfill average obligation, Hungary failed to fulfill its obligation, and the Czech Republic failed to fulfill its obligation. Um, the ruling was positive because it gives a signal for creating and maintaining a common EU migration system. And I have there on the slide a nice quote um, that uh, Ursula von der Leyen um, uh, mentioned, that all member states were required to participate in a temporary relocation scheme, Hungary, Poland and Czech. Did, the Czech Republic did not, and today the court found that as a, consequence, as a consequence did not fulfill their obligation. It will give guidance for the future. So in terms of analysis for this particular judgment, and I'll stay here for a bit because it's crucial, I would say that the court focused primarily on the conditions under which it may be possible to refuse a relocation for an applicant for international protection. And in this context, the court found that it's accessible to refuse uh, relocation in two circumstances. First, if there are serious reasons for applying the exclusion provisions in the Directive um, 2011-95, pointing that the exclusion from protection status may be merely cannot be merely uh, maybe merely sorry justified by the fact that the beneficiary of international protection has committed a serious crime, and in this context, the exclusion from um, the status may follow exclusively on the basis of a full investigation into all the circumstances of that particular individual case. And then secondly, if there are reasonable grounds for believing for, that the applicant is a danger to national security or public order. 
And the Court of Justice of the EU in this case found that this provision clearly leaves a wide margin of discretion to the member state than the serious reasons for applying the exclusion provisions contained um, in the qualification directive. So in that part, as regards the, man the, um, the margin of discretion, the court in that judgment counterbalanced the wide margin of discretion with the need to conduct an examination of the individual case based on consistent, objective, and specific uh, uh, evidence that supports the assumption that the individual concern actually or potentially represents a, a danger. And secondly, the necessity to rely on an individualized assessment genuinely places the opportunity to refuse the relocation of a third country national in the hands of administration. And that was made clear from the judgment. Um, I think that was a positive judgment. It did leave um, some unresolved questions uh, for instance, um, as to whether um, the court may allow in the future member states to resort to an Article 70, to, to Article 72, in order to derogate from union law in context of combating, for instance, the spread of um, COVID-19, or the situation of asylum seekers at the Greek-Turkish border. Uh, this remains to be seen, and perhaps uh, Minos, who follows my presentation, can tell us about whether this is something that we can consider. Um, so the wide discretion as well is another point which for me requires um, further clarification. However, it is overwhelmingly a positive judgment and one that has been encouraged. The second judgment, I'm not going to even try to pronounce the full name. Let's just call it, let's just call it PPU. That particular judgment um, has, is the parallel, the lookalike that I was referring before, Ophelia and Ahmed. Uh, but before the Court of Justice of the EU. And in terms of impact litigation, this is a very well-known technique. You put the same matter, if that's possible, at the same time or momentum before the two courts, and then you see what the two courts say and how the two legal um, regimes interact, if at all. So PPU um, includes two cases concerning the situation following the arrival of Afghan and Iranian nationals in Hungary. They applied for asylum in the Roske transit zone, so again, exactly the same transit zone as Elias and Ahmed, but their applications were rejected as inadmissible because they had arrived in Hungary by Serbia, a safe country. In both cases, the Hungarian authorities issued return orders to Serbia. However, Serbia refused to readmit the applicants as they had lawfully entered Hungary and were thus excluded from the readmission agreement between the two countries. The Hungarian Migration Police amended the return decisions, changing the destination country from Serbia to Afghanistan and Iran, respectively. In both cases, the, um, uh, the, the applicants brought an action before the referring court seeking to annul the return orders as they were return decisions and would be open to judicial review. In addition, they submitted an administrative appeal requesting that the referring court recognize Hungary's failure to comply with its obligation to accommodate them outside the Roske transit zone. The domestic court stayed proceedings and referred several questions to the Court of Justice of the EU, focusing on the inadmissibility ground of a safe transit country and the nature of the Roske transit zone, as well as possible de facto detention and its incompatibility with EU law. Similar case, similar facts, but not exactly the same, definitely the same transit zone. Um, in terms of um, the administrative amendment of the destination country in a return decision after the under the return directive, the court considered that a change of the destination country in the return decision is so substantial that it should be regarded as a new return decision. And we did not agree with Hungary's argument that the order with the modified destination was a return, that's a modified order following the return order since the former must comply with the latter's content. An obvious point. The court held that uh, the characteristics of such a remedy should comply with Article 47 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU, even if that provision permits the challenge to be brought before non-judicial bodies, and therefore a review before an, a Charter of Fundamental Rights compliant judicial body should be available for all appeals against the modified return decision. The National Court is therefore required to hear and decide the appeals brought by the applicants against the asylum authorities' rejection of their objections against the modified re um, reception decisions. Now, 
Regarding the safe transit country under EU law, which was again a very big point under Elias and Ahmed, mere transit through a country cannot be considered a connection under Article 38.2, nor can it nor can transit satisfy the obligation of national authorities to individually consider the safety of the third country and the significance of the on of the connecting link. That was a very, very big finding. The, the safe transit country concept cannot be based on Article 35 either, as it is not conditional on the applicant's benefit of international protection or generally sufficient protection against refoulement. So a really good and positive finding regarding um, safe transit under EU law. However, it was found in us. Now, let's go to what we really, really care about, which is the transit zone as a place of detention under EU law and whether detention um, uh, and whether that complies with EU law. So neither the reception conditions directive nor Article 43 of the Asylum Procedures Directive found this court authorized detention in transit zones for a period exceeding four weeks, even in the event of arrivals involving a large number of asylum seekers. So detention under the reception conditions directive must comply with the relevant guarantees under EU law including being based on a reasoned decision of detention, consisting of a measure of last resort, following of an individualized assessment of the case, ensuring its necessity and proportionality. The court held, very, very importantly, that the detention measure under the returns directive is permissible only if the removal process risks being jeopardized. The absence of a judicial review national registration is contrary to the reception conditions directive and the returns directive provisions, and contravenes Article 47 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Domestic courts are required to disapply any such legislation that hinders judicial review. Where detention is unlawful, domestic courts may release the applicant and order the authorities to provide accommodation in line with the reception condition directive provision. Again, so Articles 8 and 9 of the reception conditions directive say that an applicant for international protection who is subject, or respectively Article 15 of the Returns Condition Directive, a third country national who is subject to a return decision um, should not, um, I'm sorry, that was a point that I meant to say later. I'm very, I apologize for this. Now, let's look first at three points concerning the PPU judgment. First, the court found that in the, the situation in the Roske transit zone resembles a detention regime under EU law. Why the court found that? First, because the applicants were confined with any lawful possibility to leave the area on their own will. Secondly, <clears throat> because entering Serbia could incur penalties for unlawful entry, while the act of leaving the designated transit zones can negatively affect their asylum procedure under Hungarian law. The court noted the site's characteristics, including the closed perimeter of the zone, the high fences and the barbed wire. And these findings were also, they also contributed to that conclusion. Further analysis is one that includes a comparison between the one of, between Elias and Ahmed, the finding in Elias and Ahmed in detention and PPU. In Elias and Ahmed, uh, the ECHR found that the same living conditions experienced by applicants in the same transit zone, not to have amounted to deprivation of liberty within the meaning of Article 5 of the Convention, with the consequence that this provision has been declared inapplicable. Now, does that mean that asylum seekers are better protected from detention in transit zones under EU law or under ECHR law? At, on its face, the judgment in PPU may cause people to think that PPU offers a more extensive protection. But I think that this, would, this is more of a superficial examination and that there are definitely benefits that one can take over from the Elias and Ahmed judgment in this assessment. And I'm happy to develop this opinion about which system is better, offers more protection in a debate during the question time in case you are all um, interested. Um, as means of conclusion, regarding the PPU judgment, I would say that 
what we get as principle is that domestic courts of EU member states should not confine themselves to examining such situations um, in, under only one of the legal systems concerned, depending on the circumstances, either of them in terms of the systems um, can provide the higher protection against unlawful detention of asylum seekers. So you don't have to necessarily pick PPU or Ilias and Ahmed when you have to apply and you have to decide which of the two systems gives you better protection against detention and transit zones. And domestic courts of EU member states are indeed bound to apply the higher of the measures of protection. So you have indeed at the end an extra safeguard. But again, we can say a lot um, in the debate between PPU and Elias and Ahmed, and I'm a little bit concerned for time because I know that we are almost um, that we are almost over. We have another 10 minutes. Um, I will uh, move to um, the another judgment, which is WM versus Stadt Frankfurt am Main. The case concerned the detention of an irregular third country national in a prison establishment for the purpose of removal. The applicant is a Tunisian national living in Germany who has, issued, who has been issued with a deportation order on the grounds that he posed a danger to society due to inter alia his alleged radical <clears throat> Islamist convictions. His application for interim measures was rejected on the basis that the authorities deemed um, to have been a sufficient probability that he would commit a terrorist offense in Germany and an order for his detention in a prison establishment pending removal was consequently issued. The referring court referred a question to the CJU on the compatibility of such an order for detention with Article 16.1 of the Return Directive. So um, the court's findings, what the court found is whether what the court ruled on was whether detention, the detention order was compatible with Article 16 of the Returns Directive. And the court observed that the second sentence of Article 16.1 of the Returns Directive allows for derogation from the principle of detaining an irregularly staying third country national in specialized detention centers in strict circumstances. Any detention order issued pursuant to the Returns Directive must comply with the principle of proportionality in relation to the means and objective pursued, respect the fundamental rights of the returnee, and should be issued on the basis of a case-by-case -case assessment. The court held that 16.1 does not preclude national legislation which allows an irregularly staying third country national to be held in detention in a prison establishment for the purpose of removal, if separated from ordinary prisons on the grounds that they represent a genuine, present, and sufficiently serious threat the fundamental interest of society. Now, we could make comparisons uh, between this and, um, the, and the judgment regarding the Czech Republic, um, the, the first judgment that we looked uh, against the three countries. Let me see whether I can move this a bit further down. No, that's a different judgment. Um, but as a matter of commentary, I have two things to share with you. The first one is that this judgment follows the jurisprudence already established by the court in the Commission versus Poland, Hungary and the Czech Republic. And secondly, both judgments actually agree that even though member states remain competent to adopt measures to safeguard their own internal security and public order, their, that competence is not hermetically shielded from union law. Rather, the union may adopt measures affecting and delimited this, delimiting this national competence. So, um, and that's even more the case in the area of freedom, security, and justice. So that is the important find the, the important finding in terms of commentary in WM versus Stadt Frankfurt and Maine. The next case I have to share with you is BMM and others versus Etat Belge. Now, um, in terms of um, facts, the applicant recognized as a refugee by Belgium applied for the family reunification of his three minor children at the Belgian embassy Dakar, Senegal in 2013. Their subsequent requests were rejected on the basis that inter alia, the birth dates of the two applicants were different to those that the father had provided and one applicant had reached the age of majority. The applicant appealed against the decision before the Conseil d'État arguing that the interpretation of the Conseil de Cotentier de Dieu étranger violated the principle of effectiveness of EU law and the right to an effective remedy insofar as it prevented them from enjoying the right to family reunification under Article 4 of Directive 86, 2003. The court suspended proceedings and referred to the court for a preliminary ruling. 
So as to question one, um, the court had, the CJEU had previously clarified that the directive requires member states in specific cases to authorize family reunification of certain members of the sponsor's family without being left any margin of appreciation. And there's a lot of case law to cite on this point. The court has clarified that the provisions of the directive on family reunification require that family reunification is a general rule and that the directive is interpreted strictly. The interpretations of the provision of the directive should not deprive them of the effect of its effectiveness. And the CJU also highlighted that states must examine application in the interest of the children and with the view to promoting family life. That was very, very important and a helpful extract of the judgment. As regards to the question two that was referred, that is, can an appeal against the decision of an application for entry in residence be rejected on the sole ground that the child has reached the age of majority? So something that we often encounter in asylum cases. The court clearly stated that unaccompanied minors who attained the age of majority in a previous case during the asylum procedure retain their right to family reunification. That's, um, that's ANS C550-16. In this respect, the states do not have a margin of appreciation to limit the right to family reunification of children with their parents if they entered the state as minors and got confirmation of their status by the state once they were already adults. So a couple of conclusions before I am forced to finish the presentation a bit early is that the states have a positive obligation, this is what something that came out of this judgment, to ensure children's effective enjoyment of their right for respective and family life. Under both EU and international law, the child's best interests must be a primary consideration for all judicial and administrative authorities in any decision concerned with the child's respect um, for, um, for child's right of respect to their uh, his or her family life. And the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child and uh, the UN Committee on the Rights of Migrant Workers in their joint general statement on children in the context of international migration stress that countries should facilitate family reunification procedures in order to complete them in an expeditious manner in line with the best interests of the child, something that has very much been considered by the court in this particular case, and something that can be, I think, overwhelmingly commented on as a positive development. Now, I have in another judgment, which we unfortunately do not have time to look over, um, and then that's, that would be the end of my presentation. So instead of rushing through, squeezing, get another judgment in your heads, I'd like to summarize the, followings, uh, the, the following conclusions um, that have, to me, uh, that have struck me as um, obvious, having reviewed extensively the jurisprudence of the court this year. So the jurisprudence, the recent jurisprudence from the Strasbourg court and the Luxembourg court in this area this year has built upon international norms and has helped develop and strengthen measures and protections, arguably in some areas. There have been some disappointing rulings in Elias and Ahmed versus Hungary, and in NT and NT versus Spain, and Assadi, and Bilalova to a lesser extent. However, we have seen some important progresses strengthening asylum law for the vulnerable individuals. So we have seen, for instance, the strengthening of the Dublin regulation in the sense of transient countries do not triggering the Dublin regulation. Um, something that was given to us by the CJU. The notion that decisions are to be made in child's best interests has been strengthened. Detention centers should only be used as a measure of absolute last resort. We saw this both in Villalova um, and in other judgments that was consistent jurisprudence before. Individualized personal interviews are crucial, albeit we have seen that in jurisprudence this year, the circumstances of personal interviews and what is considered as extensive or satisfactory assessment may have been put this year under a bit of a question mark. Asylum seekers must not be kept under EU law in transit zones for longer than four weeks. That's an important gift that was given to us by PPU. And member states must abide by the commitments to asylum seekers as outlined in council decisions. That was the fantastic ruling against the three countries that failed to fulfill their relocation engagements. Now, leaving you with a little bit of a look to, towards the future, we, see, we saw what the court had to give for this year, and that was a lot, but we also have to look at what the future holds for 2021. 
We are expecting decisions in many important cases, which we hopefully may want to hopefully see um, in the next year. And we also have seen some communicated cases that came out this year and we may see them progressing in the next. JB versus Greece was a case that um, communicated on 18th May 2017. Um, and uh, the judgment is still pending. And I'm mentioning this is because, according to the facts, the applicant had left Syria and alleges because of his Christian Armenian ethnicity, he was threatened by the Islamic State. Uh, he entered Turkey and subsequently arrived to Greece. He was detained in the premises of Moria and um, the Lesbos Regional Asylum Office declared the applicant's asylum application as inadmissible because Turkey, Turkey was considered as a safer country under the EU-Turkey agreement. So JB versus Greece is a case that is currently pending before the court and will look at issues such as um, what is the validity and impact um, on the principle of safe third country of the EU-Turkey agreement or statement if you prefer, and also what is the role within the, within the proceedings um, of EASO. Um, and um, the compatibility of participation of EASO in the asylum procedures within a national um, context. So a huge judgment is expected, and we are expected also to we're expecting to see if that judgment will follow a previous judgment on the valid, on the um, uh, the issue of the EU Turkey statement. JR versus Grace. If you haven't read it, I really um, suggest you read it. It's a quite controversial. We are also expecting to see SB versus Croatia. That's a case that um, the Air Center with its strategic litigation partners, ECRE, uh, the Dutch Refugee Council, and ICJ have sought permission to intervene. SB versus Croatia um, um, has is a case with Syrian nationals who currently reside in Germany and the Netherlands. And at the time, the first applicant was a 17-year-old minor and they claim to have clandestinely entered Croatia from Bosnia and Herzegovina on different occasions with groups of other persons. And the applicants claim in SB versus Croatia that they were apprehended by the armed Croatian officers and forced to return to Bosnia and Herzegovina without being allowed to submit any kind of statement or having their situation examined by an officer. One, one of the applicants complains being beaten by officers made to board a van unfit for human transportation taken to a police cell without access to food or water for hours. So they complain in SB versus Croatia that their return without an assessment of the risk exposed them to dire living condition and a dysfunctional asylum system. Um, they complained that they were um, expelled in a group of individuals in violation of Article 4, Protocol 4. So this would be, when we, whenever it is that we have a judgment on SB versus Croatia, a great opportunity for the court to again consider the controversial NDNNT um, versus Spain judgment. Then we have HD versus Greece and Germany, a case that has been communicated last year and that it, we currently are in the process of submitting our third party intervention. We have, um, and this case uh, considers um, the case of a Syrian national who arrived in Greece and was detained with a view to arrange his return to Turkey. Um, in July 2018, that applicant was re registered his application for asylum. The process was interrupted after he was arrested in Germany. He was subsequently returned to Greece and detained at the Athens airport before being transferred to the reception and identification center in Leros, a small Greek island. Um, the applicant objected to his detention at the Leros police station and um, he claimed he has allegations of uh, vulnerable due, vulnerability due to depression and um, the ex exacerbation of this due to detention. He complains that his return to Greece was incompatible with Article 3 and that he was unable to access an effective remedy to challenge his return. So the court in HD versus Germany coming up will have the opportunity to discuss um, the um, applicants with mental health problems, so increased vulnerability, and, um, and where there have been calls to enhance the training, for instance, and reception officers. Um, or reception conditions. So we know for a fact that EASO has been calling for further training of reception condition officers in reception centers. Um, and this case may be indeed an opportunity to, um, to examine just that. Now, two pending cases that I will have saved for you for the end are Darbo in Camara and Trawali versus Italy. Um, the first one, Darbo in Camara, is an accompanying minors in poor reception conditions in a hotspot in Italy. And in that particular case, the minors, um, if we want to run through it, 
were detained, uh, were, were kept in facilities together with unrelated adults, something that now after this presentation should ring bells uh, regarding whether this is in accordance with, uh, with, law, with the law or not. And Travali versus Italy concerning detention of unaccompanied minors in violation of Articles 3, 5, and 8. Again, something that we faced already and has been addressed by the court in the jurisprudence of this year um, by saying that detention of unaccompanied minors should be a measure of last resort and only in very specific suitable conditions and for a very limited amount of time and only when it's in the best interests. So again, having in mind all that jurisprudence that the very active European Court of Human Rights produced this year, um, we may have a hint on what to expect from the upcoming judgments and pending cases before the court. And um, it's something really fascinating to see the case law developing. But um, of course, monitoring the judgments and keeping in track of everything that's happening is, is, is a full-time job. So if, you, if at any stage you need any assistance or um, anything that the Air Center uh, can help with, uh, we do remain at your disposal. And I really hope that you have enjoyed this presentation and have taken away the main findings of the court this year to have been a bit, a bit challenging, yet with really lots of good points to incorporate into efforts for future litigation. Thank you very much.